It's nice, really nice to see you and uh, be together. And actually, I wanted to make um, being together this the sort of the introductory theme of the of the session. I don't think we'll do more than like one hour or, or one and a half, depending how much you want to talk. Um, but one of the ideas of that I want to go, touch on as kind of an introduction to Bhagavad Gita is about association and about relation and what happens in relations. And so it's really nice to see to see you, uh, to be with you, to feel you too, because Paris is, of course, the super city of Maya. It's all superficial energy. Beauty is uh, something which is just on the surface, and so it's uh, very uh, lonely from a spiritual point of view, and it's nice to be with you and with Jonas when, he, when he's around. So let's um, help on I think I managed everything. Let's take a moment to remember um, and give our respects to our dear Gurudev and to his Gurudev, Radha Govinda Das Babaji, to the Vaishnavas, to our Sampradaya, our spiritual family. And once again, this is a question of relations. We think about our spiritual family, we think about our Guru, we think about our Param Guru, because this is the way that um, our knowledge about divine love gets transferred to us. It's not through books, it's not through television, it's not um, ever direct, it's through association with people and good souls who have already this experience. So that's why we pay our respects every time. That's why I'm so grateful to be with you. And that's why I'm so grateful to be with uh, my, the rest of my family, spiritual family and Guru Dev when, when I can. And the class is about Bhagavad Gita. Yes, of course. But um, for this reason, it, it really should be about sharing too. And, and um, I may be talking a little bit more than usual this first time and, and less than the next times because we'll read. But um, please just jump in, interrupt, say what's on your mind or ask a question or ask a question to, to, um, to the group. It's all, it's all really uh, admitted. It's supposed to be a sharing. That's why we call it. It's Guru Dev invented this concept and I want to use it to, to the highest. Um, the goal of the class is not to explain Bhagavad Gita, neither from me explaining it to you or you explaining it to me. Some of the people I've corresponded with lately about the class have had some opinions about it, what it means and what I should say, these kinds of things. So it's not about <clears throat> a scientific reading. I couldn't even give one. I'm not an expert. I'm just a reader like you. It's about um, it's about deepening our our above, deepening our spiritual feeling, getting closer to God, getting closer to um, divine love. So, when we read a spiritual text like this, when when we're together with devotees like these, the idea is to increase our feelings, increase our above, increase our the, the intensity of, of our mood, our moods. The goal of the whole operation, everything we do in our practice, is to become closer to to come closer to Manjari Bhav, to the the role of of making divine love possible in in the world, and we all contribute to this by the way we live our emotions, live out our love, live out our our relations uh, to others. So we want Manjari Bhav, the idea of the, the helpers of God, the helpers of uh, Radha Mohan to increase. We want this to become greater and deeper. We want to lift it up. We want to expand it. We want to think more about it and more deeply about this. And we do it in ourselves, but we also do it for our Gurudev. We do it in order to help him raise his level of uh, Manjari Bhav. By God, I mean, of course, Radha Mohan. In our, in our tradition, we talk about Radha Mohan as God, and not everybody in the meeting is in that tradition. But Radha Mohan is this idea of the appearance of God in a double form. 
as both lover and beloved. And it's the basis of our idea, our conviction, our belief that that God is is love, is loving itself, and that the, the universe is governed by, by loving relations. And the highest form of that is a God, Radha Mohan, which is the combination of loving and uh, being loved. So the highest form of love, Prema, we call that, as you know, divine love, is rather a loving relation. And that's what we want to try to strengthen, both in our own lives, to get closer to God, but also for others um, um, around, around us. So the idea could never be in this kind of class to instruct you about love. I'm doing the best I can, like you. Um, but to develop ways of thinking, ways of imagining, ways of associating that can strengthen our our love, to make it deeper, to make it um, stronger, both individually and collectively. Um, Bhagavad Gita, then, is a very wonderful book. Uh, most everybody has read it. Probably everybody here has read it at least once. It's a very unique association. It's a sangha. It's a, it's a conversation between Krishna and one of his devotees. And this is strange already from the start, because what God has a conversation with his believers in the Abrahamic religions in the West, God is doing all the talking. And if uh, we're praying back to God in Christianity and Islam and Judaism, we're, we're praying to a relatively silent God. There's not a dialogue. But here we have God and Arjuna, the disciple, the devotee he's, he's talking to, in a full loving dialogue, in a friendship. And it's called a friendship everywhere in the Bhagavad Gita. We are friends with God. Arjuna is a friend with God. It's very strange compared to, compared to Western um, uh, traditions. But that becomes then the model. This is also Gurudev's meditation of uh, our relation to God, that it's one of love in two ways, it goes both ways. It's the model for uh, our loving relation with God and uh, with others. God and Arjuna talk, they, they love each other both ways. The one is the devoted to the other, the one is a loyal friend to the other. And this is the model for the kind of relations we want to have with God, with Guru, with, with, with others. Gurudev's realization uh, about this in his reading of uh, Bhagavad Gita is that the energy that makes this relationship possible, the relationship between us and God, the relationship between Krishna and Arjuna, <coughs> is Radha. So it's this female, the female component of Radha Mohan. She is the energizing force of the love. She is the model for loving itself. She is the model for how we want to uh, love uh, God and how we want to love uh, others. So, Gurudev, you might have noticed in the in the in the chats and in the in the classes recently, has been reading lots of Bhagavad Gita. And before I left Vrindavan two weeks ago, I was reading a lot with him, and very interested in exactly this this question, the 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 way that the Radha is playing a role in this relationship between Arjuna and Krishna. She's never named, not in any verse. And actually Prabhupada doesn't talk about her either in the in his commentaries. He mentions her in the introduction, you might have noticed. But she's never not named. But Gurudev finds her and sees her as the, the energy which makes this divine love possible and the relationship between soul and super soul between Arjuna and Krishna uh, possible. And I'll show you some examples of that in the, in the text. Um, so Prabhupada is interested in this. Prabhupada sees Radha, Radharani there. And that's why Gurudev is so uh, interested in Prabhupada's commentary. And I got a few suggestions these last days that we should also read other versions, other commentaries of Bhagavad Gita. 
but I think we'll make this one the center because Prabhupada is very conscious of this relationship between Radha and Krishna and, and the soul. And it comes out again and again in, in Gurudev's reading, and I'll, I'll try to point that uh, out to you. Radha is the, the energy, the divine loving energy that Prabhupada um, describes really repeatedly. So that's what the, the sort of the, the model of the dialogue in Bhagavad Gita is that one. Yeah. It's one between the soul and the super soul, or if you like, between Arjuna and Krishna, between the devotee uh, and God, between us uh, and God. And what makes that loving relationship possible is Radha. Yeah. She's the model of loving. Let me say a word about Kipa because this is also, as you know, a very important idea in our Sampradaya, and an important idea for Gurudev. And it also comes up directly and indirectly in uh, Bhagavad Gita. Kripa is mercy. Kripa is mercy. But what does that mean? We use it so often, and I often wonder what that actually, uh, actually means. It means that you're asking for something that you already have, that you're given something without asking. That's the You're given something without even asking for it, whether it's love, whether it's wealth, whether it's uh, happiness. Kripa means, mercy means that it was already yours before you even thought of asking for it. You already had it. And this is, this is a, one way of thinking very deeply about the idea of divine love. Because what we find in Bhagavad Gita and really in the in the other texts that we like to read together, like Radha Rasa Sudhaniti and, and Vilapa Kusmanjari, we find that divine love is already inside everyone. You see this in the introduction uh, of the Bhagavad Gita too, that, um, that the divine spirit and divine love is already part of everyone's soul, everyone, good, bad, and ugly but that it's covered, that it's covered by material life, by material uh, experiences, and that the task of our, of our practice, uh, our path, is to uncover it. So it's not a matter of having to go out there and hunt for it. We're not bad and we have to become good, as in the sort of conservative Christian methodology. It's already there. We're already divine. It's already all within us. And it's covered up by our distractions and by material uh, existence, material um, life. And this brings us back to the, the sort of double message that comes up in the introduction of Bhagavad Gita. Uh, one is that, and it's a message that comes out in the first, let's see, six chapters of Bhagavad Gita. And that's that I'm not, I'm not the creator of my world, of anything in my world. Uh, I'm, I didn't make it. I couldn't have made it. Uh, and the second idea is that I'm not the enjoyer of it. I'm not the last benefactor of it. I'm not, I'm not the one who benefits from it in the end. And the arrogance, the consistent thing that I made my world, that I'm the author of my world, that I'm sort of a mini god, is the one that gets erased by uncovering our souls and, and moving forward in, in spiritual practice. So the error we make, the double error we make, according to Bhagavad Gita, and it's uh, confirmed in lots of things that Gurudev teaches us, is that I am the author of my life, that I just make it up because I'm so clever, so beautiful, so wise, so good, that I just make it up and construct it along the way. And secondly, that if I'm enjoying my life, if I'm benefiting from my life, that I think I'm, that's the end, that I'm the only one. And neither of these is true. The sense of our world comes from Radha Mohan, from God, and the final enjoyer of, of, of what we do in our lives is, is also God. The same applies everywhere in our lives. I'm not the creator of this group. Uh, I didn't create you. I didn't bring you together. 
I carried out a few actions that came from the inspiration of Gurudev, and his inspirations came from somewhere else, and that person's inspirations came from somewhere else. And, and all of it is in the same sort of lineage of transmission of divine inspiration. And by the same token, the group's not for me. As much as I'm glad to be with you, I'm not the end of the, let's say, the food chain of the benefit of us being together. It's going to go to others, transmitted to you. It's transmitted to other people who are not um, even there. The group is created by the mercy of Gurudev, by the mercy of Radha Mohan, and it's created for Gurudev and for Radha Mohan's enjoyment. So when we talk about mercy, we mean that when we talk about Kripa, Guru Kripa, or Radha Mohan Kripa, we're talking about the way that this gift was already given. We didn't have to do anything. I didn't have to do anything except open up my heart and say, that's a lovely idea. And that said, opening up the heart, scraping away a little level of my Paris uh, Maya, of that covering of my the, of the divine in my own soul, that lets this happen. So it's far more a matter of getting out of the way of God than doing something which is which is um, godly. So that's what mercy is, and this is what. I talk about the mercy of Gurudev, but he will tell you at once that he experiences the same uh, mercy from his Gurudev. And he'll even tell you that he experiences the mercy of his devotees, that he's grateful to us for what we give to him. Um, so this experience of mercy is an experience of humility, an experience of respect, and an experience of knowing where we are in the, in the, in the cosmos. And only by recognizing this, by saying that it flows through me, it doesn't flow from me. That I'm an instrument. That I'm a, I'm I'm a, I'm I'm part of the pipeline for for the flow. It's only by recognizing this that we can really find happiness and 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 fulfillness. Fulfilledness. So, like I said, that mercy was the fact that Guru Dev has become very interested in this book. And that's why, really, that the inspiration uh, for this. And and one thing he's said to us many times, maybe some of you have heard this, is that um, the more he advances in the more uh, uh, the texts that are directly dealing with the divine love, texts like the Lapa Kusmanjari, texts like Radha Rasa Suriniti, the more he dives into these, the more we dive into these, the more we want to go back. The more Gurudev says it makes him want to go back to Chaitanya Charitamrita, to go back to Bhagavatam, and to go back to uh, Bhagavad Gita. So I'd say even one year ago, if you ask Gurudev, do you want to read the Bhagavad Gita? He would say, no, I'm not interested. I don't have time. I'm busy. I'm busy with the Lapakus Mantan. But today, it's a prime focus because that's where he finds, enriched by his knowledge, his diving into the Leela, the loving pastimes, the stories of divine love that we find in the Raghunath Taskoswami, he's finding new light and new uh, understanding of the origins of, the, of this, uh, let's say, this, the, this tradition. So it's really on his request that we're doing this, because he wants to share this with you and and I want to share this with you, and because I want to learn uh, uh, myself. That's the job that we have. That's that's the task. So, so to share, to share these ideas, not to give us an end-to-end -end ex explanation of, of the book. And it's not even end-to-end. -end. I'll come back to that in a minute. Not to give an end-to-end -end explanation, but to, to share how it feels to connect this book with our own experiences, to connect this book with the experiences of reading the more advanced um, uh, books about the loving pastimes, again, the Lapakus Manjari and, and, and others. We want to help Gurudev along his path, supporting his reading of Bhagavad Gita by doing our own reading of it. So making sort of a super soul out of, out of this, this reading, linking together with his reading, being together with him, being in his flow and creating an, an, a, a sort of a supplement to his flow. 
And then a bit more pragmatically, because some of you are, are beginners in, <laughs> in, um, in bhakti, uh, it's to give a bit better understanding of bhakti yoga, some of the basic ideas of it, and, and to review for the others those ideas that Gurudev <coughs> emphasizes so much. So there are certain number, as you know, there are certain numbers of, of ideas and concepts and words and, and feelings and thoughts that he has that come again and again when we talk with him and, and listen to him. And these have, have connections with Bhagavad Gita. And I'm going to try to make these con con connections uh, for you. So there are things that we, we can then ultimately share, feeling, uh, things about... Uh, ideas about our experiences of love, our experiences of of uh, of prayer, our experiences of 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 being uh, together. So Gurudev asked me to read Bhagavad Gita in a very special way, um, and that way is that we're going to start, and probably next week I think because uh, we won't want to take so much time today. We're going to start with uh, chapter nine. Read chapter nine, ten, eleven, and twelve probably 13, and then go back to the beginning. Why is that? Well, Bhagavad Gita is, it's not a revolution, but Gurudev has emphasized the way it's divided into three zones. The first six, it's 18 chapters, six times three. So the first ones, the six, first six, six chapters is the discovery Arjuna's discovery that he has a soul. So it's what you might call Gopi Bhav section. The, the idea, the discovery that we have a soul, that we are not this body, that there's a distinction between body and soul, there's an opposition between body and soul. The second group, chapters 7 to 12, uh, are about discovering the loving relation in the soul. So it's more about bhakti, properly speaking. It's presenting the bhakti, the idea of bhakti yoga and, and what it means. So it's discovering that this relation between soul and God is one of loving devotion. Bhakti, of course, means devotion or, or loving devotion. So this is the second sequence of, and that, that's, of course, the one that Gurudev is most interested in because he's most interested in, in deepening this, this feeling of of loving devotion and our loving devotion for uh, Radha Mon and and the and the activities of Radha, and then the third is about perfecting the soul. You could say, also very interesting, but it's that middle one that is particularly relevant for the way that um, in our in our little family in our uh, sampradaya we talk about um, things. So in our reading of Vilapakusmanjari. This poem that we, this poem of prayers that we read uh, almost every day, and in the Radharaja Sudhiniti, uh, we come back to these ideas again and again that are developed in the middle part of Bhagavad Gita. So the instructions are clear instructions from Gurudev that we'll start with chapter nine next time, go to chapter 10, 11, and 12, and finish this, this sort of high point of bhakti and what it is. And then sneak, take a little peek into what's beyond, and then we'll go back and, and start. And I think what we'll do is, is really just read it slowly together. Like I won't be talking every time like I'm doing now. And again, the floor is open for anybody who wants to share. Um, but we'll read together and we'll comment together and uh, it'll go quite slowly, but I think it will be very rich, uh, rich and nice. And the question will always be, how does Bhagavad Gita help us to understand the Gaudiya Vaishnava tradition, our tradition? How does it help us to understand bhakti? And most important, how does it help us to understand what we do in everyday life, in our everyday practice of, of bhakti? And it really does get quite practical in some places, the Bhagavad Gita, giving really concrete ideas about how to meditate, how to think about God, how to... Uh, uh, make devotion to to um, to gods, to guru, and 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 others. So that's kind of um, the plan. The first part starts. The first part starts with the relationship between soul and God. The second part 
the the question of uh, devotion and loving relation between soul and God, and then the third part, the perfection of, of this of the soul. Now that's kind of the, the sort of general background for what I, I hope we can do in this in this in this group. Um, and now I wanted to come back, if you like, and you're welcome to you're welcome to share or or question or comment. Um, I thought I would come back to some of the basic ideas that in are in are in our practice of Gaudiya Vaishnavism and the ones that are going to come up in Bhagavad Gita and the ones that do come up in Bhagavad Gita and talk about them, sort of present them also in my own personal way, but to try to link them to, to Gurudev's teaching so that we have a clear sort of starting point for, for reading Bhagavad Gita. And the first, the first idea has to be love. Where else would we start? But with love and divine love in particular. And the, the really down-to-earth, pragmatic insight, really it's so fundamental and so easy that um, to be a human being is to love. We can really just start there and go from there to every point we want to go in life. If we realize that completely, that you can take away so much from a human being. Okay, I'm not going to take food and water, but we can, we can scrape away so much of the superficial parts of human life, and we would stay humans. You could take off an arm or two, maybe. You could take away this and that quality. You could take away what we do and what we, and what we see and what we, and what we think. But the one thing you cannot take away and still have a human being, it's it's love. That's. It's, it's not religion, it's not even spirituality, this. It's almost just, you know, anthropology. But you can't be human without loving. And then the second question is, what does this mean for us? And what does it mean about what we should do? What can, about how we should act, what we really are, who we really are, why we feel the way we do? We can't survive without love, so how do we love? In a way, this is the second question. How do we love? Uh, what is it like to experience love? And this seems like an easy question at, at the start first, but it's actually a difficult one, I think. In a lot of ways, and Gurudev talks about this a lot in his, in his, uh, in his um, sharing, in a lot of ways, loving is the easiest thing to do. It's primordial, and Gurudev often speaks of the baby relation to the mother. There's a sort of automatic, perfect, organic, loving relationship between the, the newborn and the mother, and it's signified by the connection through the breast, and sometimes uh, Gurudev talks about the uh, umbilical, umbilical uh, cord as well. But then, as we often hear and we all know, we grow beyond this. So the ideal form of love, this sort of perfect unity of love, which is also close to divine love, it's just that we leave it at once, we become individuals, we leave the breast, we leave the mother's milk at some stage, as long as we want to make it go on, we have to leave it at some stage. And then we move on and we love other things. Eventually we love the father, who has no breast of any interest to us, but still has a very close relationship to us. We come to love our siblings. We come to love the rest of our family. We learn how to love the people around us that are not in our family. And then we're taught gradually to, to love our, let's say, community, to love our, our country. We're, we're, we're taught to love a certain number of things like our house and our car, our iPhone. You know, these are the things that we become that become objects of our love. But at a certain point, and it's a different point for everybody, we begin to wonder what, what is it we're loving? Uh, and what is it we should be loving? What is it to love? When my iPhone is my main uh, boyfriend, then there's something that we need to be we talking about. So then we can ask what it is to love. What does it mean to love my mother? What does it mean to, to love my sister or my, or my husband? 
Is it um, his beautiful smile that I love? Is it his shiny muscles that I love? And my wife, is it her fragrant hair? The cut of her chin? Is it her intelligence? Is it because she's a good dancer? All these things that I say to anybody that I love, is that really what the love of my wife or my husband or, or my brother or sister is about? And the, the answer is yes, of course it is. But the answer is also that it's, that's not all it's about. There's still something more. And depending on where we are in our lives and how we feel and how we, how, how we experience our love, for most of us, it comes to a point where we, we realize, we suspect at least, there's, that there's something more to love and there's something more to loving, something that goes beyond, um, especially when our, our loving relations become day to, day to day. So the child is born, loves the mother, loves the father, family, and grows to move on bigger and bigger and bigger, but there's a limit to how much we can love and, and to, to who we can um, love. So this idea of what makes us love and what makes something lovable becomes more and more difficult the older uh, we get. Now, people in this little family know that the source of love is something divine, that divine love is the model of all love. And divine loving is somehow the model of divine love as well. But the problem is how to realize that. The problem is how to put that in our lives, how to live that divine love when we're just ordinary uh, people. So one question that Bhagavad Gita asks, you'll see, is what does it mean to realize? What does that word mean? We hear that every day in our, in our practice and in our study. What does it mean to realize something? Um, so I've thought a bit about it, and, and, and I think you could say that it means to see that thing everywhere. So when we realize divine love, it's because we see it everywhere. When we can, when we can see the divine in strangers on the street just by looking in their eyes, and we can, I challenge you, when you meet a stranger on the street, look in their eyes and find divine love there, find God there, then you're starting to know what realization is. So re to be realized about this is to see divine love everywhere, to see it fully, to see it in everything, to see it in the plants, to see it in my, in my books, to see it in my dog, to see it in my wife, to see it uh, everywhere, to see it in all parts of reality. It means making divine love reality itself. So constantly being focused on it, not by having to grit our teeth and try to, but by being relaxed and focused on the divinity in everything we do, in washing the dishes, in cleaning up, in putting on our clothes, in walking to, to work or walking to, to school. We can see it, we can feel it in everything we do once we uh, put our minds to it. Who is the expert of feeling divine love? Well, the gopis of Vrindavan. They're the top, they're the models, the manjaris. Those are the ones who can see, recognize, and know divine love uh, anywhere. And it's their job to make it stay alive in the loving relation of Radha Mohan. People who are realized, like our dear Gurudev, see divine love everywhere. They see it in everything. And above all, they see it in you. So everywhere where you don't see divine love in yourself, that's where our Gurudev and others like him um, see it, which is why we stay close to him and associate with him so we can discover it uh, ourselves. So he even sees the, 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 the divinity in me that I can't see. For better or worse, I can't see it myself. What is divine love? It's this kind of, you know, this love of God, love of Krishna, that's completely pure, like absolutely pure water. And we talk often about nectar. It's the ocean of nectar. There's not a trace of worldly anything. It's all just pure 
uh, experience, nothing material uh, about it. It's a, a white paper without even a touch of uh, of, link, uh, of ink. Sorry. And once again, this is all available to us. It's in us already, but we cannot see it as long as we're covered by material uh, energy. So Bhagavad Gita, to come back, is is then an introduction to the path to uncovering divine love. Some philosophical ways, but also some very concrete ways to go through life, look towards everyday reality, and uncover the divine uh, in that. So it's an introduction to Bhakti Yoga, really. And this is what Prabhupada says in the introduction um, somewhere. Um, so let's talk about that, Bhakti Yoga. What is Bhakti Yoga? Bhakti then is love or devotion, the loving devotion. And yoga, you, I'm sure you know, means connection or union you know, or bringing uh, together. So let's start with the last one, connection. A connection, that's what we're trying to do right here. That's what a sangha is. It's a family, a connection. It's through gatherings like this, through being together one-on-one -on -one and, and, and sharing things. It's through relation. It's about learning about through others by loving them, not by just collecting data about them, not just collecting information. When I ask you how you are, yes, you can tell me that your, your meter 70 and your, your temperature is this and your foot size is that, and then I know something about how you are. But what I really want to know how you are is the way you say it, the tone of your voice when you say a meter 70, and the look in your eye when you say I'm a size 43. These are the things that I really want to know, and more and more I want to know. And this is where we learn. This is what connection is. It's not just the sharing of information, uh, but it's the sharing of the emotion, the sharing of the feeling that carries the information. If you didn't care about me, you wouldn't care about my meter 70. You wouldn't hear it. It would go right through you. So somewhere attached, glued to the one meter 70 information is a trace of love that's coming from me to you. And if you hear it, it's because you have a trace of love for me um, as well. That's what matters to us. And that's what we try to cultivate. And the more we can dampen the information part, the 170 part, and bring up the care that is attached to the 170, caring how tall you are, caring what your body means to you, caring what your height means to you, caring what you feel about it, feeling the same, feeling the differences. This is where something is really happening, something divine is really um, happening. It cannot happen in the mind. Sorry, it's a bit banal, but it has to be said. It happens in the heart. It happens uh, in the soul. So the degree that your shoe size touches me in the soul, and it does, it becomes a matter for divine um, loving. So in relations, this is what we need to aspire to, in all relations. In the relationship to my cat, who seems very mechanical about everything, but is full of feelings too, in my relationship to, to you, my relationship to my to my mother, and on. Yes, we can talk about the weather, but make sure when we talk about the weather, there's love which is attached to the underside of it. And the message about the weather is a message of caring. Like it's going to be 40 degrees in Paris tomorrow, and I'm very worried about everybody, I tell that. And this is why we talk so much about parampara. This is why I start by paying my respects to Guru. Because where knowledge about divine love comes is not through information. It's not in the books. It's not on the papers. There's no podcast. It comes from the, the feeling. It comes from the energy. It comes from me sitting with you, looking at you, seeing your body, seeing how you perspire, seeing how you move, seeing how you feel, detecting your, your, your emotions and your inner spiritual uh, uh, being, that's how I learn about divine love. Not from you saying, oh, divine love, that, that's described very, very clearly in book three, chapter five. Not at all. So that's why being together and being together in an assertive way 
in a way that is directly linking to the heart of the other. That is our path to, to finding the divine. So parampara, the, the sort of lineage, is the way that this kind of knowledge is passed. It's not passed through blood. It's not just who you're born from, though sometimes that happens too. It's not passed through the intellect. It's not who your professor was. Like here in France, it's very important to say who your professor was when you went to university, because that tells somebody who you are. It, that tells nothing. It comes through the proximity of the heart. It comes from you being together, sitting together, feeling together with other people who are more experienced than you, who are more, who are more pure uh, than you. That's where we find our way to divine love. And that's the function of a guru. We don't say teacher. We say guru because a guru is a special kind of teacher. One who gives his or her lessons through the heart. The important thing that comes from the guru is through the heart. Anything that comes from me to you as your mini guru is coming from the love I hold for you and, and the, the desire I have to, to share with you and to, and to have uh, back. So you hear a lot about parampara in, in Bhagavad Gita, particularly in the early chapters. This is very common in, in, in books like uh, the spiritual books like this. It's very important to note who came from whom spiritually. So Bhagavad Gita, also in the inter introduction, there's a nice explanation of it, and I encourage you uh, to read that. Describes how that relationship happened, that transmission happens. It's really very, very beautiful. It's not genetic, genetic. it's not academic, not scientific. It's the spirit, and it comes by uh, association. And that's why sharing is so important, this word sharing that we use um, so often. It's not about sharing information, it's about sharing experiences, memories, and, and feelings. And there's no memory, there's no experience, there's no feeling that is more important for sharing than love. So the only mystery for us is how to share it. Uh, and it's a difficult one, I'm sure you know. I know I know all of you here, and I know your hearts to some degree. And sharing love, wanting to say enough, wanting to give enough, giving back enough, is a great challenge, and it's it's a it's a tragic challenge. It shouldn't be. It's our material it's our material coverings that are blocking this 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 uh, this this sharing. Again, as Gurudev tells us again and again, love is the point. Love um, is the goal. So we have to look for non intellectual ways to do that to pass that along through expressing emotions through voice through the eyes as i was saying you look into the person you don't know and you you find the divine but it also comes through tastes uh, and this is this is why i laugh because i laugh with joy and, and great love because our dear guru dev is so keen on making us enjoy the flavor of food right food in this material world enjoying all the flavors that are to be had from food, from eating. And it's because he wants to stimulate our feelings of love through that, to taste the love in the food, to taste the feelings that, that are available to us, and to stir up our emotions through the spices and through the, and through the, the recipes that, that we have. So it's, it sounds really mundane. And food is a mundane thing. Right? It's apples and oranges and, and beans. But when it's made with love, then there's love in it. And there's love that comes out of it. Yeah? So we can find this transfer, this non-intellectual transfer of love of the divine, also in this kind of experience. We can find it in music, which is why we listen to music, why we, why we, why we sing. Uh, in our in our spiritual practice, we can find it in dancing, which is why we dance in our in our spiritual practice. All these things that bypass our silly intellect, which we need, of course, we're not ungrateful, but which ask our our intellect to please excuse me, would you get out of the way? I have some things to do with my heart. These all these there are a hundred detours around this. Without uh, which don't require us to eliminate it all altogether. Another way to transfer is 
transfer divine love. We have the non-intellectual way. It's through non what the what the scriptures call non-furtative uh, activities, non-fruitative activities. Sorry, non-fruitative, or the, um, we call that in the West non-instrumental, and that's activities where the point, the goal, is not the result of the thing. The reason we cook is not to make a pie. The reason we cook is to pass something along, which is not the pie. So doing things that don't have a goal, or another way we see it said, uh, detaching ourselves from the goal, doing things and not caring how it comes out, doing things only by the pure instinct in our hearts to do it, doing things like sweeping a, a floor inside a football stadium, you know, which could never come to an end, but we do it only to do it because it lets us exteriorize, lets us express something of the divine um, that's in our that's in our heart. So non-instrumental or non-fruitative activities, that's a way of doing it. And then we, of course, we talk about seva, uh, of doing seva, which is service without any particular objective. We do service only to serve. This is why we're, we have a spirit of service, a mood of service, which is so important to us, because it's a way of nurturing the divine in us and also nurturing um, the, the passage of divine love to, to others around us. So activities that are done for their own sake, or we could put it another way, for the sake only of God or for the sake of Radha Mohan. We do things only for that, and we will become more fulfilled, more happy, more deep in our in our uh, realization. It's really quite magical. Most of you here have had the experience. So both of these kinds of practices um, of yoga, of connecting, of of, re of relation, are about going beyond material things, and it's not it's not complicated. Uh, it's very simple, very simple practices in everyday life of looking to others, of looking for the heart of the other, of doing things not for our egoistic um, aims, but for uh, God or dedicating them to God or to, to just to doing them not at all, uh, doing them for, for nothing or nobody at all. Okay, that's the yoga part. Now briefly about the devotion part. Uh, um, what is devotion? Bhakti yoga, devotional connection. Well, this answer has two parts as well, like the last one. There's a material answer, there's a material part of it, and there's a spiritual uh, part of it. Um, we, le we learn to love materially, we learn to love in this world in order to, in order to learn to love uh, in the spiritual world. The fact that we feel love in our heart is not some sort of distraction or some confusion from being clearer and being more pure. It's the heart which makes the, the, the divinity itself. So it's this idea that Prabhupada talks about also in the introduction to Bhagavad Gita, that God is personal. There's a whole, there's a whole strain of Hinduism and Buddhism too that insist that God is impersonal. That to become pure and become close to God means to let go of all of the distractions that happen in our lives, in our in our hearts, and in our in our in our minds. Prabhupada's answer to this, and certainly our Guru's answer to this, is that love uh, is personal, and it's 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 right to live it out in material ways as long as it's done so in a, in, a, in, a, in a spirit of honesty, in a spirit of, of, of purity, and, and by seeing it as a manifestation of uh, divine love. So if we want to know how God would love, or how God's love, what God's love would look like, we can give a taste of it, just a little taste of it, in our own loving practices. And the more we meditate on 
divine love, the more we read works like um, the Lapa Kusmanjari and Radha Rasa Sudaniti, we can get more insight into what that looks like. And the more we stay close to our guru and 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 uh, associate with him and other devotees, we can see uh, what that looks like. Which is why, and this is the last thing I want to say, sorry if I've been a bit long. This is why we are so fortunate. We, by fort- by we, I mean uh, Gaudiya Vaishnavas, people, people following this, this, um, this tradition. We're so fortunate because unlike those be- who, who became, who came before Mahaprabhu, Mahaprabhu who came, appeared as a manifestation of Krishna at the end of the 15th century, 1480 something. He came in order to show that God is loving. God is nothing more, nothing less than loving. To show the model, to actually act out in real life what it looks like for God to be a lover and gave us a model ourselves to be lovers, to be lovers and beloved, you can, you could say. So we must be really, really grateful that we've been born into this time after that, the last 500 years, when there's a whole tradition of rich thinking and rich devotion, people finding out what Mahaprabhu taught, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, what he showed us and what his then devotees, the Goswamis and others, what they showed us about being, being uh, lovers. And everything about the, the Vrindavan Leela, about the loving practices of Krishna and Radha, that comes out only in this period uh, that we have. Only in that period do we have God actually showing what divine love looks like so that we can learn from it and be, become more divine in our own um, loving practice. So there's kind of a model for us, which others before you know, 1500 or so did not have. And that we get to see it straight on and straight away. It's really quite beautiful time to be uh, alive for that uh, reason. We have a we have a playbook for being lovers, for divine love. So, that was a lot of talking, and that's really not the way I hope uh, uh, the, the class will be other times. I promise I won't talk so much other times, and we'll put our noses in Bhagavad Gita and hear what it has to say. I thought by by way of closing, we could actually look at a page of Bhagavad Gita and see some of these points about um, connection. And I have a page, let's see where my keyboard is. I suggested the, the book for you and you could download it, but I also actually have it right here on my thing and I'll show you. So if you're on the introduction, that's what I wanted to show you. There's the introduction of the 1972 edition which is also quite beautiful because right here he's doing talking about the, the um, parampara, the sampradaya, the family that, that we live in. And he says, well, thank you to my guru, to the to Rupa Goswami, to Chaitanya Mahaprabhu and all those that we need to think of. And it's, it's a beautiful song that maybe we can learn to sing uh, together as well. So there's that. And then here on about page four is what I wanted to look you, show you just in closing today. So he's talking about right at the top he, on the, in the Sanskrit verse that we won't, um, that we won't uh, go through what yoga is, uh, what bhakti yoga is, essentially. And here he tells us, and it's uh, quite straight away about relation and about loving uh, relation. I don't know. Does somebody want to read? Yuga, do you want to like? Do you want to read that? Can you see it and read, so I don't have to talk so much. Can you, you talk see? to me. Yes, I'm talking to you. Do you want to read a little bit for us this page? Can okay, you from from here, here the Lord. Lord. Okay, so here the Lord informs Arjuna that this system of yoga, the Bhagavad Gita, was first spoken to the Sun God. And the sun god explained to the uh, explained it to Manu, and Manu explained it to Ikshavaku, and in that way, my disciplic succession, one speaker after another, 
this yoga system has been coming down. Good. Just, but, just a sec. Yeah, so the, the system of yoga, the system of transmission, system of bringing the divine word down, it happens through disciplic relations. It doesn't happen by the one bought the book of the other or listened to the podcast of the other. They were together, they talked together, they felt together, and they associated with each other. So this is the, the whole system of Bhagavad Gita is a yoga system, a, a connection system of bringing things together by association. Okay, go on. Sorry. <laughs> but in the course of time, it has come, lo it has become lost. Consequently, the Lord has to speak it again, this time to Arjuna on the battlefield of Kurukshetra. He tells Arjuna that he is relating this supreme secret to him because he is his devotee and his friends. The purport of this is that Bhagavad Gita is a treatise which is ex especially meant for the devotee of the Lord. Okay. Okay, here again, this is kind of what I said at the outset. Bhagavad Gita is a treatise for devotees. In other words, you need to love God to understand it. Full stop. You need to be devoted to God in order to understand it. It's not just words on the page. It's not just science. It's not just intellectualism. You have to have love in your heart. And it really wouldn't matter what you think God is, Allah or Jesus or whatever, but you have to have that loving feeling in your heart. Your heart has to be open. And that's the only way you can understand Bhagavad Gita. It's the only way you can understand uh, at all. All right, go on. <laughs> there are three classes of transcendentalists, namely the Janani, the Yogi, and the Bhakta, or the impersonalist, impersonalist the meditator, and the devotee. Here the Lord clearly tells Arjuna that he is making him the first receiver of the new parampara, disciplic succession, because the old succession was broken. It was the Lord's wish, therefore, to establish another parampara in the, name line, in the same line of thought that was coming down from the sun god to others, and it was his wish that his teaching dis distributed anew by Arjuna. He wanted Arjuna to become the authority in understanding the Bhagavad Gita. So we see that the Bhagavad Gita is instructed to Arjuna, especially because Arjuna was a devotee of the Lord, a direct student of Krishna and his intimate friend. Therefore, Bhagavad Gita is best understood by a person who has qualities similar to Arjuna's. But that is to say that he must be a devotee in a direct relationship to the Lord. As soon as one becomes a devotee of the Lord, he also has a direct relationship with the Lord. Okay, thank you. So there, that's it really in a nutshell, this notion of relation. And then the need for love in order to understand the reality of, of, of the world, unless we can open our hearts like this, unless we can have a loving relationship with God, whatever you understand God to be. I say that because there's a bit of a diverse audience today. Whatever we think God will be, we cannot embrace the truth about the universe, the truth about the world, if we just think it, that it's science. Because also science was created. Also, science belongs inside some other system. So that the question is, what is that system that in which science is meaningful? And that's a system which is governed by, uh, accessible by, and governed by uh, divine love. The three classes of transcendentalists, in case you're just curious, the, um, the Jayan in, in Sanskrit, we say uh, Gani, with the, the G sound, Gani, Yogi, and Bhakta. So the Gani, this means those who are concerned with knowledge, they, they think they can reach God by knowledge alone. The yogis, so the impersonalists that I mentioned before, if we know enough, we fill our brains with enough knowledge, infinite knowledge maybe, we can find God. 
the yogis are the ones that are doing just practice, just uh, meditating or other kinds of practice. And then the bhaktas are the lovers. That's us, right? The bhaktas are the ones, the devotees, that have a loving relationship to God, whatever that God uh, may be in our lives. So there's a little taste. I think actually I'm going to stop there. And if you have your own comments or questions or ideas, then we can take some time for that now. Or I don't have a question, actually, but I want to thank you very much um, for this first uh, lesson or lecture or sharing. And I really want to say that you, your explanations, they were like Guru Dev always say, it's so simple. <laughs> and you really made it very simple for understanding. And it was very, very nice. And thank you so much for this. And I really hope this goes on. And we can continue also this um, first page you were reading. Page four is always so important for Guru Dev. And you explained it very, very nicely and make, made me remembering. Oh, good. <laughs> I'm so and happy. Thank you very much, Udav Bella. Thank Lovely. you. Lovely. I'm, I'm so happy. Good. We'll try to continue that. We will indeed. Thank you. Okay. Well, homework for next time, for next week, then read this introduction if you haven't. We'll go a little bit farther on it. And then we'll jump over to chapter nine. So read, uh, read chapter nine or at least say half of it.